but there we go. All right, it is great to be with you this morning, and I am thrilled that Mike Bonham is here today. So I just tell you a little, briefly the story. I was reading an article, I think it was the Lewis Center, and it was talking about what it's like as the church um, to continue post-pandemic. And it's interesting, Mike, that was right before Delta began to surge again when I read that article, but I immediately resonated with what Mike shared. Um, he was practical, he was realistic, and he had a vision for our future together. And uh, so I reached out to Mike. It's at that point, I'm getting some feedback here. I'm just going to move Dennis. Uh, it was at that point uh, that as I reached out to Mike, I realized that I knew Mike. I had read his book already, which is Leading from the Second Chair. Has anybody read that? It is a great read for those of you who are working in partnership um, as either an associate pastor or working on staff or at laity who work with a senior pastor. It's a great read. Um, and so as I was talking with Mike and learning more, I realized indeed his own work, his writing had shaped my own ministry. So Mike is a consultant, coach, author, speaker, husband, and father. He's worked as, with churches, ministries, and Christian leaders for over 20 years. He's currently with the Texas Methodist Foundation, which is where Lisa Greenwood, who is with us, uh, came, and he's written four books on ministry leadership, served over a decade as an executive pastor, and has equipped ministry leaders throughout the country. And I know that you're going to be blessed um, by Mike's conversation today. So before we begin this morning, let's just pause uh, this morning for a moment of prayer. God, we thank you. We greet you. We praise you on this brand new day. You've offered it to us with grace. And God, every day you give us the manna that we need, even in the wilderness. So this day, we thank you for Mike. We pray, God, that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon him, that his words this day might even be fresh manna, that from this conversation, we might continue to be transformational leaders in our churches and our communities. Bless those are here, who are here this day and those who will view this recording later, um, that from it, indeed, we might live out your gospel. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Don. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so glad to be able to be with you today. Um, let me just say a couple of more things to get our time started. Uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to uh, start running through some PowerPoint slides that will guide our conversation today, and I will send that PowerPoint to Dawn uh, when we're done so that in addition to the recording, you, she can give you access to the, uh, to the actual slides that we'll be using. Um, we're going a couple of different times today. Uh, I'm going to stop and invite your interaction with the material that I will be sharing and uh, there will be several different ways you can interact. We'll have some opportunities for you to ask questions or make comments. Uh, and so I really want to encourage you to do that. Uh, Dawn is also going to keep an eye on the chat feature in Zoom. And so if you think of a question as I'm sharing uh, some material, you can also pop it into the chat. And then when we take those pauses, uh, Dawn will be able to uh, share comments or questions that have popped up in the chat. Uh, and we'll also, I think two different times, uh, stop and put you into breakout rooms on Zoom. Uh, and one of the reasons that I like to do that is I really believe that the value of any speaker's presentation is not just in what the speaker says, but in how you really process it. And one of the best ways to process material is to talk with other people about what you've heard and what you're thinking. Uh, and so... I know that in a large group, larger group on Zoom, it can be hard to figure out, well, is it okay for me to say something right now? Uh, but in a smaller group of you know five or so in a breakout room, you can do that easily. And so, um, like I said, just know that you're going to have that kind of opportunity to interact as well. And I hope that you will take full advantage of it. Uh, we're scheduled to go until noon, your time. I'm in central time zone, so 11 o'clock my time. Um, and we'll make sure we finish by then, probably a few minutes before that. Uh, and I know that's a long time to sit on a Zoom call, and so we're going to make sure we take a break uh, in the middle. So uh, if you're wondering, is it okay for me to be drinking that coffee right now? Is he really going to let me go, get up and go to the restroom somewhere along the way? The answer is absolutely yes, somewhere right around the midpoint uh, of our conversation. Um, so that's it for just kind of the, the 
the background. Um, and I'm going to uh, pull up on the screen the presentation material now. So uh, the, the title, as you know, for this conversation today is emerging from the pandemic uh, and specifically thinking about how your church will emerge from the pandemic. Uh, and and I, my understanding is we have pastors, associate pastors, uh, and volunteer leaders of different types, different sorts, uh, all participating in this uh, conversation. Uh, and I think that what we talk about here will be interesting and uh, applicable for all of you. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about three different things. We're gonna talk briefly about what is going on. Uh, and we'll talk in general about what is going on in uh, the United States with the pandemic and then specifically what is going on in the world of church. That's really just introductory material for us to then get into a conversation of what does this mean for my congregation? Uh, and we'll spend the majority of our time on that. But then um, before we close out our time, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what does this mean for you personally? Um, and particularly, what does this mean for the clergy people who are participating in the call? And what does this mean for the volunteers who help and support and work alongside uh, clergy people and staff people in churches? Because uh, this is a really, really tough time to be in ministry leadership. Uh, and so I want to make sure that we not only talk about what does this mean for our congregations, but what does this mean for us individually? So what is going on? So uh, in the early days and, and really continuing through the pandemic, there's been conversations in kind of the broader business and economic sphere that, that we, we took that hit to the economy almost immediately. And people started saying, what, will, will we recover? How will we recover? What will the recovery look like? And some of the experts said they thought that we would experience what they called a K-shaped economic recovery. And what they meant by that was everybody took a hit in those first few months in kind of spring and early summer of 2020 uh, as far as businesses. But the, the speculation was that some industries would recover much better than others. And so you think about technology and retail uh, as industries that really have done relatively well after those first couple of months. You think of other industries like travel, uh, hospitality that really have not have continued to struggle uh, even up to this point in time. And that's what they meant by K-shaped recovery. You can kind of imagine letter K with those diverging blue and uh, peach colored lines on this graph. And in fact, we can see that uh, in real companies. If you look and, and stock prices are just an easy way to think about this. If you look at a dollar invested in three different companies at the end of 2019, a dollar invested in Apple, a dollar invested in Target, uh, and a dollar invested in Carnival Cruise Lines. For any of those investments, if you looked in the spring of 2020, say kind of late March, April timeframe, you would have lost money. You would have lost a lot more money on Carnival. You would, only, you would have lost more than 75% of your investment. On Carnival at that point, you would have lost about 25% of your investment in Apple and Target at that point. But look at where we are just a couple of weeks ago. Apple stock is worth more than double what it was worth before the pandemic began. Target is worth almost double what it was worth. Now, you know, it's kind of funny because we know of Apple as a tech company and, you know, a star performer. You may think of Target as just sort of a, a, a retail company, and yet they've done very well, at least on their stock price during this time. Carnival Cruise Line, not so much, right? It's that K-shaped recovery that the economists were speculating about. And even within an industry, this is the airline industry, the recovery is not the same for everyone. Southwest Airlines uh, and United Airlines are the two that are shown on this chart. Both of them took huge hits in those first few months of the pandemic and their stock prices. But today, a dollar that you had invested in Southwest Airlines has almost recovered its full value from, to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and in fact, a couple of months ago, it was a little bit above its pre-pandemic level. 
United Airlines, on the other hand, is still only worth about 50 cents on the dollar. The point of all of this is that the pandemic, while it has deeply impacted all of us, all businesses, all churches, all different kinds of organizations, it has not affected everyone and every organization equally. And so the question that I think it raises for us is, are we looking at a K-shaped recovery for churches as well? In other words, will some churches come out of the pandemic relatively strong, relatively healthy, while other churches come out of the pandemic in much worse shape, uh, still really struggling? Now, even as I say that, I think it's important to make uh, one significant uh, distinction. Because the economy, the, the, the U.S. economy pre-COVID uh, was doing well. All, most of the economic indicators uh, were fairly positive in the broad macroeconomic sense pre-COVID. Now, you know, I'm, and this is not a commentary about income disparity and, and you know, anything like that, income inequality, anything like that. This is talking in the broad macro sense. The economy is doing relatively well pre-COVID. The church world, uh, you know, we already saw some disturbing trends that had been going on long before the pandemic. And so you're probably familiar with data like this. It, it's often referred to as the rise of the nuns. And nuns are in Pew Research, Pew Research Center is one of the leading researchers on trends in America. Pew Research for years has been tracking uh, religious affiliation among Americans. Uh, and nuns is their shorthand, or, or the, really the shorthand in the popular press for people who say that, who when asked, what is your religious affiliation? They would say none, I have no religious affiliation. Uh, it's not even asking the question, what church are you a member of? It's just saying, do you identify as Christian or Jewish or Muslim or, and they've got a long list. It's, a, it's an exhaustive list. And at the end of the list, there's always the option for someone to say, I don't identify as any of those. Uh, what you see on this chart is that uh, for all Americans, there has been a slow but steady increase from 2009 to 2019 in the number of people who identify as with no religious affiliation. So that um, in the most recent Pew results, about 25% of America, of all adult Americans identified as nuns, there's no religious affiliation. Millennials, um, that youngest generation of adults, we, you know, we're just now starting to see Gen Z, which are younger than millennials. But millennials, um, we're now at about 40% of them who identify as none. So this is one of those trends that we see that predated COVID that was already creating uh, pressure and tension for churches in America. A similar trend comes out of Gallup research. And this, their question is, do you happen to be a member of a church, synagogue, or mosque? And you see from, 20, from 2000 to 2020, the steady decline and the number of people who answered yes to that question. Uh, and it made the news in a pretty significant way most recently when the number actually dipped below 50% for the first time. Uh, so uh, in 2020, only 47% of the people in that particular survey said that they were a member of a church, synagogue, or mosque. Now, you know, if you're trying to reconcile the previous slide and this one, you probably all have people in your church who attend with some regularity, maybe even very regularly, but who have never chosen to become members. And the, the tendency to not be members is most pronounced among the younger generations. Uh, but these two charts, it, while the, the numbers may look a little bit different, are both showing similar kinds of trends that people are just less interested in institutional religion, institutional expressions of religion today than they have been in the past. That's a trend that was going on long before COVID. And in some ways, I think a question that many people are asking is, has the pandemic accelerated that trend? Has it pushed people even further 
away from interest in faith and interest in religion. Uh, and interestingly, the answer to that is mixed. There's actually some, there are actually some signs of hope in the data that we see more recently. The, there's a lot of information on this chart, so I'll take a minute to, just to go through it. These are from, this is data that I pulled out of three different relatively recent surveys. Uh, Pew Research asked uh, US adults whether their faith had gotten stronger or weaker or stayed about the same as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. 23% of adults answering that question said their faith had actually gotten stronger during the pandemic and only 4% said that it had gotten weaker. The balance uh, said that their faith had remained about the same. Uh, so even as many of us are wondering, gosh, what is this going to do to us? There's a significant percent of the adult population that is saying, uh, you know, my faith has gotten stronger in this difficult time. Now, you know, if you think about it, uh, that should, in some ways, that should not be surprising. When I, I was just with a, uh, the small group that I'm a part of last night, and we were talking about prayer and, you know, kind of patterns of prayer in our individual lives. And one of the other participants in the group said, you know, I hate to say it, but I don't pray nearly as often when things are going well for me. You probably resonate with that or know people who, of whom that is true. Uh, in times of national crisis, and, you know, we could think, you know, we just had the 20th anniversary of 9-11. You may remember how full churches were in those first few weeks after uh, the 9-11 attacks. Uh, in times of crisis, people are more inclined to, to turn back to their faith. And so as we think, as we get further into what this means for our congregation, uh, I think this is an interesting question for us to think about is how can we capitalize on people who have turned more towards God in these last few months? The second set of data uh, looks over a much longer period of time. Uh, it's out of Gallup research. It's U.S. adults who pray to God often, and often is one of the answers on the question, outside of religious services. So praying on their own or praying in a small group, but not in the worship, but 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 in addition to whatever they may experience and whatever they may be praying in a worship service. Uh, and interestingly, again, even as the number of people who identify as religiously unaffiliated has gone up, the number of people, the percentage of people who say they pray to God outside of religious services has also gone up. You wouldn't necessarily expect that. And of course, this is over a 30 year gap from 1990 to 2020. So prayer continues to be a significant part and maybe has even increased, or not maybe, has increased in, in its role in the lives of many people in the country. And then this last one is the one that I find in some ways most interesting. Uh, Lifeway Research several months ago did a survey and they asked uh, survey participants what their plans were for attending worship services after COVID. And the question was qualified uh, to, if I remember correctly, for the participant to ba basically be able to make their own determination when what after COVID meant. Uh, but basically when, when the participant felt like it would be safe to go back to church. Uh, and so, you know, I have four adult children. Um, one of them would say, oh, it's safe to go back to church right now. And it has been for months. The other one would probably say, it's not safe to go back to church now, and I have no idea when it will be uh, safe to go back to church, right? So the, this, this question about that LifeWay is asking allows the participants to make their own determination of when it would be safe to go back. But then it's asking, so when you do feel like it's safe to go back, what do you think your attendance pattern will be? 23% said that they expected to attend more frequently. And 68% said they expected to attend about the same amount that they do right now, right now or pre-COVID. Pre, pre That's 91%. That only leaves 9% who are saying less uh, or who did not answer the question. Now, I find that, now I, I know that this is just what people say. That's not necessarily what they do. I know we could put a big asterisk 
on, on the survey in that respect. But I cannot tell you how many pastors and church leaders I talk to in the work that I do for whom the big question is, are our people going to come back? What can we expect whenever it really does feel safe for people to regather again? Uh, I've, you know, talking to people in the last month, uh, have heard everything from we're back to pre-COVID worship attendance levels uh, in a few cases. In most cases, I'm hearing kind of 50 to 60% of pre-COVID levels. In some cases, I'm hearing 30, 25 to 30% of pre-COVID levels. There's huge variation. And yet this data would say that at some point we can be hopeful that people really will come back. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put one more kind of big asterisk on this data. Uh, it doesn't say that they will come back to the same church that they were a part of pre-COVID. And I think that's something important for us to keep in mind. One of the things that, and this is going to help us to transition into the next section of the material, uh, but one of the things that has happened during COVID, particularly during those first few months when most churches uh, were not having any kind of in-person gathering and were offering uh, people digital opportunities to gather for worship, is many people took advantage of that time period to try out other churches. Uh, and so some of this 23% and 68% who plan to attend more or attend the same will, you know, that, that's talking about their frequency of worship attendance, not their location of worship attendance. That actually is a great transition point for us to talk about what does all this mean for my congregation? You know, if, if, if it's reasonable to think that there could be a K-shaped recovery for churches where some churches really thrive as we emerge from a pandemic and other churches struggle, what are the implications for individual congregations? What are some of the things that we need to be thinking about that could help our congregations be on that upper arm of the K and not the lower arm of the K. Well, based on what I'm seeing, I want to give you um, seven ideas that I think will be true of congregations that flourish. So congregations that flourish, I believe will first experience God's presence. This is so important. Now, you know, I know I'm talking to clergy people and committed volunteer leaders in churches, uh, but I also know that I've been around churches that where, you know, they kind of go through the motions, but if you said, is there really a powerful experience of God's presence in this congregation? And people answered honestly, they would say, eh, Mm, sort of, kind of, maybe. You know, if what we saw in that previous slide is accurate, that uh, some people's faith has grown, that people are looking to come back to church at similar or even increased levels, they're going to be looking for a place where uh, they experience the power of God's presence. Um, you know, the pandemic, I think one of the big questions that I, I suspect will be studied for a number of years to come is how much in terms of people's just kind of individual lives, do they return to what they were doing pre-pandemic? And how much do some of these resolutions that they've made, and I, not in New Year's resolution form, but uh, the deep rethinking of life priorities that some people have done during this, these last 18 months, how much will that stick? Uh, you know, you've probably heard people talk uh, or seen articles about the great resignation, the number of people who are quitting jobs. Um, and in, 
there are a variety of factors behind that, but one of them is people say, I hate this job um, and life's too short for me to stay in a job that I don't like. I'm going to do something that's meaningful for me. Now I say all of that because I think as people are, are saying, uh, I really want to do things that matter. I want to do things that are meaningful. I want to uh, live life in the most full and rich way possible. For those who identify as Christian, one of the ways to do that is to truly experience God's presence. And I know that's not only something that happens in corporate worship. We should be experience God's presence in our individual worship, in our study of scripture, in our prayer. But churches that help their congregation members, and not just members, those who are a part of that congregation experience God's presence, I believe will be ones that truly will flourish uh, in the days to come. The next thing is that uh, congregations that flourish will be clear about their identity and values. Um, we need to be able to say, you know, here's who we are as a church. Here's what we do as a church and not do in the sense of just busy doing, but these are the things that really uh, are distinctive about our congregation. Uh, I know Eastern Pennsylvania is a long ways from Houston, which is where I am. Uh, but one of the biggest churches in the Houston area and one that you all may be familiar with just because he's a national personality is Lakewood Church, where Joel Osteen is the pastor. Um, while I was on staff of the church where I was executive pastor, Lakewood Church moved into its current home. Uh, they had been they they had been in kind of a, a, a basically in the neighborhood on the northeast side of Houston for many 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 years, and then they moved into. Um, what I knew as a, as a native Houstonian, what I knew is the compact center. It was the basketball arena where the Houston Rockets played. And when they built a new arena for the Rockets, uh, Lakewood signed a 99 year lease to move into this huge, uh, huge space, which happened to be a mile and a half from the church where I was executive pastor. And I remember uh, several of uh, our church members coming up to me, several of our church leaders coming up to me when that announcement made the media, it uh, made the news and saying, oh, wow, what's that going to do to our church? It, you know, aren't you worried about the future of our church with Lakewood moving in so close to us? And I said, no, I'm not worried at all. Their identity is totally different than our identity as a church. I you know, the number of people who would visit our church and visit Lakewood and say, gosh, it's a toss up. I, I, but I think I'm just going to go to Lakewood. I said, that's, there's hardly anyone who's going to do that. We are so different as a congregation. Uh, we were clear about our identity. They were clear about theirs too. Uh, or I'll give you a, a different example. The church that I'm a part of now is part one of our values is that we privilege the outsider. Now, what we mean by that is that we're going to be very intentional in all that we do to try to make space for someone who is a not yet Christian, someone who maybe has been burned in a different church experience or who is not sure what they believe about faith. And so that affects the way we do our worship service. It affects the language we use. It affects uh, the, the culture that we try to set. Um, we're a six-year-old church plant. We meet in a concert venue in downtown Houston that helps us to, to set that tone and set that vibe. Uh, it's not the church that a lot of people would want to be a part of. And, you know, if a, a very churched person came in and said, oh, there's some art on the wall that I find to be offensive. It's not Christian art. We would say, you're right, it's not Christian art, but we think that being in this concert venue is one of the ways that we privilege the outsider. And so it may be that you're looking for a different kind of church than what we are. My point with all of this is that I believe that 
if we're not clear about identity and values, we just look like any other church, and that's really not much of a reason for our current members to stick or for new people to come and say, this is the church that I want to be a part of. Third, congregations that flourish will emphasize discipleship. Now, you know, I've been both excited and frustrated over the last several years at how much the conversation about discipleship has entered into kind of the prominence in uh, church circles. It seems like we just didn't talk that much about it, you know, 20 years ago. It was just sort of uh, assumed that people were doing discipleship. And yet I think what we've discovered is that whatever discipleship was happening in our churches, it, it, generically speaking and broadly speaking, was not nearly what it needed to be. Um, if we're going to be serious about the people who are wrestling with faith, who are trying to find their way back to God, who have really had their, their uh, deep existential questions raised during this pandemic, I think we also need to be serious about pointing them towards not just come to a worship service, but, but inviting them to following uh, the teachings of Jesus and the life of Jesus. And that's what discipleship is. It's helping people to take that next step of faith to look more like Jesus, to follow the teachings of scripture. Uh, people are going to be looking for that. And so, you know, as you think about your congregation, I think a fair question to ask is, how are we doing with our discipleship emphasis? Congregations and flourish, I believe, are also going to create sticky communities. And, and what I mean by sticky is that people stick together. Um, the, you know, when we, one of the things that's been very clear in the pandemic is people who had significant relationships with others uh, have found ways to maintain those relationships, right? I mean, uh, interesting. Um, my wife has stayed uh, in touch with four or five good friends from college. Uh, she's a University of Tennessee alum, and uh, they, but they haven't stayed super close. They would see each other occasionally, you know, exchange Christmas letters, that sort of thing. Uh, and when the pandemic broke out. Uh, and everybody was discovering new ways to use Zoom, they started doing an every other week Zoom call with each other. And th those relationships have gotten closer uh, because of that. But those were relationships that were already uh, in place. Too many of our churches, I think, have a, a scattering of really tight relational groups and then a whole bunch of people that are really not that relationally connected. Uh, and you go back to what I talked about earlier about people visiting other churches online during these last 18 months and maybe finding a different church they want to be a part of. I don't have any data to bear this out, but my hunch is that many of the people that will switch churches in this season are people who um, were not really tied in tightly relationally with other people at their old congregation. Now, you may not be able to do anything about people who have already left or who are on the verge of leaving, uh, but you can think a lot about as we emerge from the pandemic, what will we do to create sticky community going forward? What are we going to do to try to make sure that if uh, an existing group is really tight but really inward focused where no one can break into it. What will we do to try to create room for new people who want to find a group? Do we, can we do something with that existing group? Do we need to create new groups? What will we do to make sure that everyone that, uh, that identifies with your church as being their home, whatever that means, and I'm intentionally not using membership language. What will we do to try to create the space where they can be a part of a sticky community? Uh, where they will have those deeper relationships, um, you know, and you've, if, 
if you paid attention to the broader landscape of the church in the United States, you're well familiar with the kind of personality driven churches that we see with some of the large mega churches. Um, that's not most of your churches, if any of your churches. And that's not really how the itinerant system within Methodism is set up. Uh, and so if you think that the thing that is going to, to get people to stick with your church is a gifted pastor, that's a really dangerous proposition by itself. I, and I'm not saying we don't want gifted pastors in all of our churches. We certainly do. But sticky community, those relationships is what will help people to stay. Fifth, I think that congregations that flourish will embrace digital with purpose. And that with purpose phrase is very important to me. Uh, my assumption, and I didn't ask Don this beforehand, but my assumption is that most, if not all of the churches that are represented on this call found some way of offering a digital experience in the early days of the pandemic. If you had, so my, my last in-person consultation pre-pandemic was uh, March the 12th. I was in Memphis, Tennessee uh, with the United Methodist Church, had a meeting that night, uh, that, uh, that afternoon, uh, before the meeting that night, I met with the senior pastor to talk about what we were going to be doing. That was, uh, that was really the day that, that it became real to me because a lot of the different sporting things started canceling, you know, NBA and college basketball tournaments, that sort of thing. And uh, I remember talking to the pastor of the church uh, that afternoon, and he said, gosh, I, I don't know whether we're going to cancel our worship service this weekend or not. Uh, we'll have to make that decision pretty quickly. I guess we could cancel for a week or maybe two weeks, but we have to be back in person for Easter, you know, for Holy Week, right? I mean, you probably were part of a very similar conversation because we certainly didn't think it was going to last as long as it did. Uh, if you had asked me when I got off an, an airplane back in Houston on March the 13th, so Mike, what do you think is gonna happen to all of those smaller congregations that don't have a full-time media person, that don't have you know a tech person who knows how to put all this stuff together? I would have said, oh my goodness, they are in so much trouble. It's going to be so hard for them. And it's a good thing this is only going to last a couple of weeks because they can just shut down for two weeks and then come back, right? And I've been amazed, truly amazed at, at the creativity and the resourcefulness of all different sizes of congregations to figure out ways to get online, whether it was with Zoom or YouTube or Facebook Live or all of the above whether it was live streamed or whether it was pre-recorded, uh, I've been amazed at, at the, all the different congregations that have been able to do that. We're, we're good friends with an American who pastors an English speaking congregation in Germany. He's the only employee of the church. They don't have even a part-time admin person. Uh, he's it. He, he's the pastor, he's the admin, he's, the, he's everything. And, it's, and everything else is volunteers. They figured it out. You know, they they created for the little congregation a uh, really robust Zoom worship service. Uh, and they've had people from all around the world that have joined them, some who are former church members who had then moved off to other places. Uh, we all, we all, all or almost all figured out how to move to digital in those early days. The question for us now is, what place does digital have going forward once we really get to the other side of the pandemic? I believe that it's not a viable strategy to say we, we will quit doing digital. But that still begs the question of what should we be doing with digital? Let me give you um, two examples from churches I've worked with. One church I've, I've worked with has said, oh yeah, we, we will continue to stream our worship service live, but we really want people here in person. We do not think that digital is a good uh, viable alternative. 
We think people need to experience worship together in person. We think they we they need to experience um, groups in person. So you know when they talk about sticky community uh, in their church, they're talking about an in person experience. Uh, and so digital is very much just a front door that lets people get a taste or people who are maybe on vacation or who are sick uh, participate, but they're constantly nudging people to come back and be with us in person. A different church has said, we think that there's a viable place for digital as a worshiping community. And so we're going to, to have digital offerings. We're gonna have digital small uh, online small groups for people. Um, we're glad if people, ex- first uh, discover us online and then move to an in-person experience. But if they never walk in the doors of our church, we're okay with that too. And we're going to be ready for them. Both of those churches have a purpose. They have a strategy for what they're doing digitally. Neither one of them, and and I contrast that with with what I think would be a mistake, which is say, well, we're going to kind of do something digitally, but we don't really know what, and we don't have a purpose for it. Next is, I believe, the congregations that flourish will meet people at their point of pain. There's a lot of pain out there. I'm sure you're seeing it in your congregations, you're hearing it. Um, But the question for us to think about is, how are we responding to it? Uh, You know, I'm reading a lot about the mental health crisis uh, right now that uh, that exists because of the pandemic, the loneliness, the isolation, the uncertainty uh, that people are experiencing. How are we as congregations responding to that? That's a that's a generic uh, kind of global issue. In your own community, there may be other points of pain. There may be other places where people are really hurting. Um, you know, if if you're in um, Las Vegas or if you're in Orlando two places that are heavily, heavily dependent on the tourism industry. You have a lot of people who don't have meaningful work right now or don't have any work right now um, and who can't easily go and find a job. You have people who really thought that, you know, that industry was the, you know, something they wanted to be a part of for all of their careers. And now that may not be a possibility for them. How do we meet people at their point of pain? Um, It's what, Jesus calls us to do, but it's also part, uh, can be part of our identity as a congregation. This is, you know, this is who we are. We really minister to the people in our community, which leads me really to the last one, uh, because meeting people at their point of pain is often our own church members, but it's not limited to that. Congregations of flourish are going to serve their neighbors. Uh, Again, I mean, that's right you know, square in the middle of what the gospel calls us to do. I'm sure it's what many of your churches have done and are doing, uh, but what a wonderful opportunity right now for us as congregations to double down on ways we serve our neighbors. We may have to be more creative about it. There may be, you know, I can imagine, I I, I told Dawn before the rest of you got on, uh, my wife is a school teacher. And so I suspect that some of your churches uh, have local school partnerships. Now, if there was a church that had a local school partnership at the school where my wife teaches, they would have been told, you can have all the partnership you want, but you're not setting foot on our campus right now, you know, because of COVID restrictions. Uh, you may have to get more creative about how you serve your neighbors. But serving our neighbors is what we need to do for our congregations to flourish. It And, and Don't hear me say that by serving our neighbors, our neighbors will immediately decide they will become members of the church. I think one of the the mistakes that I see among some congregations is they'll run their ideas for, uh, for ministry in the community through a lens of which ministry will most quickly cause people to want to become a member of my church, not which ministry will best meet the need in my community. Uh, now, I think if we're really serving our neighbors, it will help our church to flourish because other people will hear about whether those particular neighbors ever become members of the church or not. You know, when when you look beneath the surface at some of the data on millennials in particular, 
you know, those people who are less and less likely to identify uh, with any religious affiliation. One of the things they really do care about is having purpose in life, about making a difference in the world. Uh, and if they see a church that really is making a difference in the local community, that is going to get their attention more than uh, almost anything else that we can do. Uh, and so, again, looking for ways to serve our neighbors is in, in a really important opportunity for, uh, for us as churches to build congregations that will flourish. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, and we're actually going to let you go into those breakout groups that I mentioned a minute ago. Before, we, before you put them into the breakout groups, Don, let me just show these two questions. Um, so two questions that I want you to talk about uh, really related to this last set of bullet points that I just shared with you. Uh, is your congregation flourishing and why or why not? And then out of some of the different things that you heard, uh, what do you think could lead to greater flourishing for your congregation? Uh, you're going to be randomly assigned into breakout groups. Uh, the, Don's going to push a button in a minute. Uh, I'd like you to spend 10 minutes talking about that, uh, which will put us to, uh, let's see, 940, 9.57 your time. And, uh, it'll, and then it'll pull you back into this main room in a minute afterwards and when the breakouts are over. And when we come back from the breakouts, I'd love to hear either a comment, something that you discussed in your breakout, or a question that you may have about any of what we've talked about so far. Uh, so again, is your congregation flourishing? And then what can lead to greater flourishing? Talk about those two questions in these breakout groups for 10 minutes. Dawn, any other instructions for them? Here we go. Alice and Reverend Cho, if you need any support, let me know. For our iPhone user, if you need any support, let me know. You know, sometimes on the phone, it can be tricky. So if you are traveling, we understand, and you can just hang out in this main room. And Mike and I will uh, turn off our video. I mean, you can shut your screen and take a moment of break if you want, Mike. Do you need anything? You're doing a I love this. I, I actually was texting a few friends, and I said, for the Apple slide, I was like, you should be on here. So I will tell them to watch the recording. Thank you for what you're doing.
Okay, I think that we are all back. I hope you had some good conversations. I would love to hear uh, just a few snippets. So what is either uh, something helpful that you heard in your breakout room or interesting or a question maybe that came up in your breakout room or that you had even before we sent you to breakout rooms? Any of those are fair game right now. Somebody's got to go first. So dive in. Shirley, you're muted. I saw your hand. Go ahead. Unmute myself here. Okay. I struggle with the word flourish. Ah, okay. Tell me. Flourish to me is mobs. <laughs> so I don't see mobs of people coming through the door. Flourish. Um, we just, I think everybody in our group said, yeah, what, what's he mean by flourish? Mm. Um, flourish some we touch base with giving faithfully um the, the offering was the, the giving was faithful through the the first pet, uh, hard year um uh they just the people are coming back or um there's some people in the community um coming in now does that qualify as flourish Tiffany, did I touch base on that well enough? Okay. So uh, I guess I would say two things. Um, use a different word if that helps you to still wrap, you know, engage in the questions and the ideas. Um, but flourish to me, I, I did not mean to, to um imply that it meant mobs. I think that, um, and I, probably, I, I should have said this, I, I think it's an appropriate, a very appropriate question. Um, it's hard for us to, uh, you know, it, 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 we, the, one of the last really uh, good, good, and I'm gonna put big air quotes on good, memories that we have from, um, pre-pandemic was probably Advent 2019, right? And, you know, it's it's rare to find a congregation that is anywhere close to that level of attendance. And so can, can we be flourishing if we're at 50% of that level of attendance right now? You know, I mentioned the small group I was in last night. We had two or three that were out because they had uh, yesterday, uh, because they had uh, kids that were sick and they had, uh, people out. So we were half the number in our small group last night that we were the first week when we met a week earlier. It was a rich conversation. So I would say the small group still flourished last night. Um, but, you know, so, but use a different word also, if that's helpful. Lloyd, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that ours has very much been a K-shaped flourishing. Certain things have gone very well and other things haven't. Um, you know, I mentioned in our small group, for instance, we just did a Sunday school registration like we normally do. And we only had five kids of families that are ready to really come back. And half of our teachers says, I, I can't be in a room with kids under 12 that are not vaccinated because of my own health. And But then other things have gone very well. We've run two disciple Bible studies this whole time online with people who could never make it to a meeting by seven o'clock because of work schedules, who just loved it, you know, and are now going into a, a second round of disciple that they never envisioned that they'd be able to do. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of mixed in terms of yes and some and kind of and and then some folks that are just not in the mix at all because of either fear of COVID or they're worried somebody will sit next to them that isn't vaccinated. You know, even though most of the people that are coming are and and we're looking at maybe half to two thirds of our, our normal in-person worship, but we've picked up a ton of people online. Our 930 service Sunday had 228 contacts. And some of those could be people that logged off and back on, but still, you know, that service usually ran 40 to 50 to 60 people average. And, you know, so 228, we know there's other people watching. And then who they are, whether they're just relatives or whether they're community or 
So it's, we've seen both. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Lloyd. And, and I appreciate you know what you said, that the, the K-shape can take place even within a congregation. Um, some things going well and other, other areas struggling. Stacy, I think I saw your hand. Yes, thank you. I think what was interesting in our group um, is that there were two distinctions. One was clear that we didn't look at the word flourishing, um, but what we said was there has been a change in the mindset. Um, there's been a change in the mindset in some of the churches as far as how they engage in ministry, um, thinking about ministering in a different way and being excited about that uh, in terms of discipleship and evangelism. Whereas in other contexts, churches are um, basically hanging in there. They have been engaged in, well, they have been at using the word of the other group, flourishing from the standpoint of maintaining, but in terms of a change in mindset that hasn't happened. In two settings, the change in mindset occurred prior to the pandemic and they're engaged. Others, it's the result of the pandemic. Thank you. Very helpful. And, and I'm going to put a bookmark there. We're going to come back and talk a little bit, pick up on something that you said in just a couple of minutes. Let's see what other comments or questions there are. Judy? Group one, we, we didn't talk about flourishing, but we did talk about vitality, meaning what we're doing and how well we are doing at this point. And the five churches, each of the churches has a digital or an online kind of presence and are returning. Returning is slow, but of the churches, it was between 30 and close to 50% uh, return. I mean, I'm just, that's a little average of the five. But um, it, it was just great to be in a group and to be able to share that information. And those, the churches represented are doing a great job. Thank you. And Dawn, the way my screen is set up, I really can't see all the participants. So there may be other people raising their hands. So if, if you need to unmute and just ask a question, make a comment, feel free to do that. I'm not seeing any at this point, Mike. Okay, then um, we will have more opportunities to interact, but I, as I said a minute ago, I want to pick up on uh, and kind of build off something that Stacy said a minute ago, and I'm gonna go back to our screen. So, um, I'm going to add one more bullet point about congregations that flourish. This very bottom bullet point. Congregations that flourish will learn to adapt or change. Here's the reality about all many of the bullet points above on this slide is as you listened to me and you thought about your particular context, um, I suspect that many of you thought, oh yeah, that, wow, yeah, that, that's something that we really ought to be paying attention to. Um, maybe it was what I said about sticky community. Uh, you're, you know, Mike, when you said, uh, there's some groups that have really deep relationships, but they're also insular and uh, it would be hard for a new person to break in. And we also have a lot of people that aren't a part of any kind of significant relational uh, network in our congregation. We need to work on that. Uh, the next thought that might have popped into your mind was the, the, it's the but, right? We need to work on that, but that's going to be hard to do because it involves some level of change, uh, which is what I heard part of Stacy's comment referring to a minute ago. Almost any of these bullet points uh, could represent, uh, it, may, it may not, but could represent some significant change in your church. And change is really hard. 
So let's talk about the challenge of trying to take some of those steps that could strengthen your congregation. And I'll start with uh, just reminding us of a very familiar story from scripture. Uh, in the Exodus story, right after the, the plagues, after Moses and the people of Israel had crossed the Red Sea shortly afterwards, we see this passage in Exodus. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Really? I mean, I, every time I read this passage, I think, how could they have said that? How could they have glamorized the oppressive slavery that they were in in Egypt to the point where they say, we'd rather be there than where we are right now. And yet, and, and, and as I say that, I know that comes across as me being very critical and thinking somehow I would have been different. And yet, if we know anything from scripture, what it often does, and I think what this story does, is it just holds up a mirror for us to say, really? Would we be that different? Are we that different? Am I that different? Um, the challenge of change, of, of leading change in a congregation is very significant. And so I want to just, I want to kind of unpack several levels of the challenge that we need to understand before we can talk about how do we address it. The first is there's this, this default to the familiar in most, among most people. And certainly when you get a group of people together in most congregations, it's let's get back to normal. Uh, I love this quote out of Harvard Business Review uh, that says, the great sucking sounds of yesterday can subtly, but importantly, pull an organization back to what it was trying to get away from. I, you know, as it, I've alluded a couple of times and, and Dawn said, in, as she introduced me, you know, my full-time work is with uh, churches and church leaders and ministry leaders, faith-based nonprofit leaders. Uh, and so I have had countless conversations over the last 18 months, really more over the last kind of 12 to 14 months, once we got past the initial shock of the pandemic, with leaders saying, we're not going to waste this crisis. We are going to take, there's, there's an opportunity in the middle of all the pain and all the suffering and all the chaos there's an opportunity for us to not go back to normal, to do some things differently. And some people have been really good about that. But again, that was part of what I think I heard in Stacy's comment from that breakout group. Um, and yet, as I've continued to talk to leaders, there's this enormous gravitational pull to go back to the way things were. Um, in many of your congregations, and maybe for even some of you, as you're sitting here and thinking about this, you know, when you think about what do I hope life will be like in my congregation, whenever we really are past the pandemic, the imagery that comes to mind is something very, very similar to uh, what it was before. And it's not just talking about attendance, but it's kind of the programming and the formatting. It's we want to go back to normal. And that presents a huge challenge to being able to lead any kind of significant change. If you think about those bullet points in the Congregation that Flourish slide, and they represent any kind of significant change in this default to the familiar, this desire to get back to normal, is a big barrier that you will have to address. Closely related, but different, I believe, is also resistance to the new. It's, you know, captured in the phrase, we've never done it that way. Um, Robert Quinn's classic book, Deep Change, uh, in, in his book, he says, we must continually choose between deep change or slow death. We would rather experience the pain of slow death than the threat of changing ourselves. 
the, you know, some people can quickly get their mind around, oh yeah, we shouldn't go back to the way it was before. We, we don't need to go back to that normal. But, and, and that can be a, a really fun, even energizing conversation, as long as you keep it at 50,000 feet at kind of the real high conceptual level. But when we start to talk about specific changes, the conversation can get bogged down very quickly. And one of the reasons is that people start resisting those specific new ideas. It's like, oh yeah, we, we, we can try some things new as long as it doesn't affect me or as long as it doesn't feel uncomfortable for me or as long as it doesn't involve me making any personal changes. And so we deal with the default to the familiar as a challenge. We deal with resistance to the new as a challenge. We also deal with, I think, just irrationality. And I call this, don't confuse me with the facts. Uh, Quinn also says, denial occurs when we are presented with painful information about ourselves, information that suggests that we need to make a deep change. You know, you can think about this in all different aspects of human life. Someone where the doctor says, look, you need to change diet and get on an exercise program because uh, otherwise your health is at risk. And at one level, they say, yeah, I need to do that. But then they really kind of deny and they say, uh, you know, maybe my health isn't that much at risk after all. Um, you can look at it um, with a parent whose child is falling behind in school. And they say, look, you need to, you need to spend more time uh, doing homework with your kid at night, making sure that they're doing their homework, seeing if they, uh, you know, helping them to get through the problems, not doing it for them, but at least helping them out. And the parent says, oh yeah, I need to do that. But then, you know, they're busy doing other things. And so they say, oh, you know, I bet my child will get caught up in school just fine on their own. Um, we can, as, as much as we'd like to pride ourselves on being rational, thoughtful human beings. We can get really irrational. Um, we, can, we can quickly deny the facts when it requires us to make change. One of, one of the most powerful examples of that that I know from church life uh, came actually from the church where I was on staff, but before I uh, had joined the staff and before actually we were even members of the church, uh, shortly before we, we joined that church, uh, they'd had a pastoral change. Uh, and so the, the, uh, the pastor who was senior pastor for nine of the 11 years that I was on staff's name is Barry. Uh, Barry came as senior pastor uh, to a church that was really in crisis. The previous senior pastor had had a moral failure. Um, and the pastor before that had been a very long tenured pastor who had uh, overseen a, a period when the church had really grown a lot. Uh, but then during his, his last couple of years, the church had begun to decline. Um, when the, when the, the pastor had the moral failure had brought some new energy into the church for a period of time. But then uh, when he left in disgrace, uh, the church had experienced a significant decline. So when you looked at the average worship attendance over the 10 years before Barry arrived as senior pastor, what you saw really was a pretty steady uh, decline in attendance uh, with just a couple of upward blips during that time. Barry held a leadership retreat uh, a few months after he arrived. And he said, you know, I think we just need to be honest about our reality as a congregation, then we can talk about what are we going to do about it. And so he showed this chart, very simple uh, line graph that showed the average worship attendance over the last 15 years, which included that 10 year run of declining attendance. And uh, the man who had been the head of the leadership body uh, during much of that time uh, stood up and said, that can't be right. That, that, that data just can't be right. We haven't been declining for 10 years. Now, folks, what I want to say is, is this is about as simple as the numbers get in church life, right? I mean, it's just an average worship attendance graph. 
there's not a lot of magic to it. There's not a lot of mystery to it. There's not a lot of room for miscalculation in it. Um, and it was just a simple fact. But in that moment, a person who had been leader during that period of decline couldn't stand to see that the decline had happened while he was in that leadership role. So his, rather than dealing with the facts and then talking about what changes might need to be made, he denied it. Now, it's just a, such a stark example to me of how we can jump in and say, look, I don't, I don't want to have to deal with those facts right now. The next um, challenge that we have is honestly skepticism among people in the congregation towards the leader. It's really the question, do I trust you? Todd Boltzinger in, in his book, uh, outstanding book, Canoeing the Mountains, says in uncharted territory, trust is as essential as the air we breathe. If trust is lost, the journey is over. Without trust, there is no travel. Now, you know, Boltzinger talks about uh, all of our churches are faced today, and, and he, he wrote this pre-pandemic, it's even more true now, with needing to move into uncharted territory. And his point is, it's really a journey going into uncharted territory. But if, people, if the people in the congregation don't trust us, they won't follow us into that uncharted territory. One of the challenges that many of us face in church leadership is a congregation that is simply saying, I'm not sure I trust you enough to follow you into that new unknown space, into uh, the change that you're talking about making. And really, we, you know, we see all four of these in the Exodus story that I just you know, read, right? We wanna go back to Egypt, even though that didn't make any sense at all. We're resistant to this new way of living, this freedom that we have and, and, and this new space. Uh, their uh, you know, re remembrance of how wonderful it was for them back in that time period is, uh, you know, is a classic case of irrationality. And it shows up not only in that uh, little story that I read, but, but in many different places as, do we really trust Moses as our leader? All of these challenges that we uh, often deal with in our churches. And then the last one is sabotage, uh, you know, which I just call not in my house. Edwin Friedman in his classic book, The Failure of Nerve, says sabotage is not merely something to be avoided or wished away. Instead, it comes with the territory of leading, which is a pretty sobering judgment. Uh, and yet I find it to be true so often in churches. Now, you may, there's all different kinds of sabotage, right? And some of it is much more painful and much more blatant than others. Um, but when we talk about leading change, we need to be prepared for someone, uh, and sometimes it's someone in our inner circle, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, nodding their head, yes, but then acting in ways to say, no, I will not be supportive, or I will even work against this change. The um, one church in Houston that I know about uh, has been declining for a number of years. They're down to uh, less than 50, and even pre-COVID, less than 50 in worship attendance. Uh, and their leadership team had uh, worked through a process where they were recommending that the church sell the property to another church. Now, the leadership team voted unanimously to, in, in favor of that idea and then took it to the congregation for a vote. Now the leadership team's large, it's about 15 or 16 people in a congregation that, like I said, only is, you know, has, has attendance of less than 50. When you add in the spouses of the leadership team members, which I know spouses don't necessarily vote in lockstep. So I, I'm, I'm stretching a bit, but you can see that the leadership team plus their spouses represents over half of the worshiping congregation. That when it came time to vote in the congregational meeting on whether to accept this proposal or not, less than 30% of the people voted yes. 
What happened? Well, I think that's probably a case of sabotage. My suspicion is that some of the leaders who voted yes in the leadership meeting, uh, when it came to the congregational vote for whatever reason, ended up voting against the very thing they voted for in that previous meeting. That's just one example. There's all different ways that sabotage can show up in a congregation. These are all the challenges that I think that we may in different ways have to deal with if we want to lead our congregations towards a brighter future on the other side of the pandemic. Now, this is a really, I know, uh, downer of a slide, uh, but there is hope on the other side of it. And we're gonna to get to that hope, but we're gonna take a break first because I promised it would take a break in about in the middle of our time. So uh, don't go away. I wanna come back and I wanna talk about the hope that we have on the other side of it. Let's take a 10 minute break. So it is 10.24 your time. We'll come back at 10.34 and I'll start promptly then. So make sure you're back online uh, and I'm gonna stop the screen sharing. I will see you back at 10.34. Uh, for the, the ideas about how we respond to those challenges. See you then. I think we're ready to begin. Great. So let me pull up the slide again. Here we go. So just as a reminder, uh, the challenges that we talked about uh, for leading well and leading change in the midst of all the, the um, pandemic and post-pandemic issues that we will be dealing with. The challenges are the defaulting to the familiar, or let's get back to normal, resistance to doing things new, which is often expressed as we've never done it that way, uh, Irrationality, which by the way, I don't recommend that you actually tell someone in the middle of a conflict over change that they're being irrational. That normally doesn't work very well. Um, but where they're almost saying, don't confuse me with the facts. Uh, skepticism, where uh, they're saying, asking the question really whether they trust you as the leader or not. And then sabotage, not in my house. So how can we, if these are the challenges, what are some of the keys to responding to those challenges? The first is your own conviction about what needs to happen. If you as a leader don't have a deep conviction of the change that needs to take place, of why change is needed, of where you're trying to go, um, then when the challenges occur, when resistance uh, arises, uh, you'll tend to shrink back very quickly. I think any leader who is going to lead change uh, needs to be prepared for there to be some level of resistance or pushback. It may be a lot, it may be a little, but don't go into it naively thinking, oh, that won't happen to me. And so with that uh, understanding that there will be resistance, you need to have the conviction that we, we need to do this. Um, we need to do this even if there is resistance, even if there is uh, some conflict or some pushback. Second part of the response that's important is for the vision to be shared. Um, the very first book that I wrote was called Leading Congregational Change. And it works from a model that vision, uh, it, the vision needs to be clear, shared, and compelling. Uh, it really works from a, a position that, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll use the biblical example, but that the Moses style of leadership where one leader hear so clearly and directly from God that, that they can then uh, tell all the rest of the people, this is where we're going, that that works occasionally, but it's a pretty rare occasion uh, that in most cases, we need to build a consensus around a shared vision. Uh, and so responding to the challenge means that we take the time to come to that, sh that shared vision together. 
there also needs to be uh, what I would call genuine urgency. Uh, the uh, literature and the experts on leadership uh, will all say that uh, if, if vision is here, and I'm holding up my hands, I know I'm very small on your screen, and, and then we also need to understand reality. And there's a gap between what our current reality is and what our vision, with the vision that God is calling us to. And that gap is what creates urgency for a congregation. Uh, maybe not for everyone in the congregation, but at least for the leaders of the congregation. And, and let me take one step further and say, I don't think that the, the most effective kind of urgency is just financial urgency. I know that, that, you know, that was mentioned from one of your uh, breakout groups earlier. And I know that's an urgency that many congregations feel if they're experiencing uh, some kind of decline. You know, we, we feel urgency because we're not sure we can pay the bills. We, you know, we may not be able to continue to do the level of ministry that we've done in the past because we don't have the money for it. That tends to be an urgency that is only felt by uh, the paid staff and maybe the, 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 the very core leadership group. When I talk about genuine urgency, while that may be part of what you're feeling as leaders, I'm talking more about an urgency that, that there is a world that needs to know about God's love. There are people, you know, going back to that, you know, one of those earlier slides that are in pain and we have something to offer them. The gospel has something to offer them. And um, we, should, we, we should be doing everything possible as a congregation to play our part in sharing that with them. Another part of the response to the challenge is really to form a broad coalition that, that I guess builds on what I was talking about a minute ago with shared vision. Uh, but here, as I talk about coalition, I'm also talking about how can we involve all the different groups in the congregation in moving towards whatever God's preferred future is? Uh, how can we get uh, different segments of the congregation to really embrace the idea of whatever changes may be needed, as hard as change may be? Now, you know, I'll sometimes when I'm uh, coaching a leader or consulting with a congregation, uh, someone will tell me, well, we'll never be able to get that group on board. And that group could be, you know, it might be the parents of the youth. It might be the choir. It might be the senior adults in the congregation. Uh, but when, whenever, whenever this phraseology is used, uh, that group will be painted with very broad brush strokes as if that group moves in this monolithic way and they all think exactly alike. And what I will often uh, say to challenge the person who's using that, that group kind of terminology is, do you really think that they are that monolithic? Do you really think that they all are thinking the exact same way? Is it possible there might be someone in that group, one of the parents among the, the parents of youth, one of the members of the choir, two of the members of the senior adults, who would be more receptive to the changes that we're talking about, and who might be a significant enough influencer that they could start to influence others? Because that's really where the power of building this coalition comes in, is if it's not all on the back uh, on the shoulders of the senior pastor or the chair of the ad board uh, to, to do the heavy lifting for change. But if others, particularly others within an affinity group can catch the vision, can sense the urgency and can start to support the changes that are being proposed. Part of responding to uh, to these challenges that we see on the left and part of, of leading change well is what I refer to as wise pacing. And what I mean by that is there's, there's an art to leading change well. 
And part of the art is knowing just how much change the organization can handle at any point in time. Uh, some leaders make the mistake of trying to do too much too quickly. And it's not that the ideas are bad. It's not that you know where we're trying to go is the wrong destination. It's just we tried to rush too much to get there. Other leaders, you know, move too slow. They're worried about offending anyone. They try to get everybody on board, even though it means going way slower than what we need to. You know, wise leadership that responds to these challenges is, is leadership that, that goes through change at the right pace. I don't want to ignore the importance of having a pastoral heart as a way to, as, as, uh, significant in responding to these challenges that we've talked about. Uh, you know, I talked about sabotage earlier and everything in our culture says that when someone is against us, we should put them on the outside. We should push them as far away as possible. We should vilify them and make them the enemy. I mean, that's certainly how we see so many cultural divides playing out right now. That's not exactly how Jesus talked about treating our enemies, is it? When he talked about loving our enemies, when Peter asked him about forgiveness and he said, you know, seven times 70 is how, how many times we need to forgive uh, those who have offended us or sinned against us. In the middle of all this, this change uh, that we're talking about, in the middle of trying to lead towards something that may be more vibrant in the future, uh, when we're going to be dealing with resistance and we're dealing with people who may uh, be undermining us, we need to respond with a gospel-shaped pastoral heart that still loves those who are making life difficult. And then finally, uh, in the midst of leading change, leaders need to over-communicate. Uh, one, one of the missteps in leadership is to forget that the conversations that you've had with the leadership team, with the core group, with the administrative board or church council, what, whatever may be the, the terminology you use uh, in your congregation, those are people who have heard and thought and prayed and wrestled with decisions. But then when you think about the broader congregation and you say, well, here's three big changes we're going to make. They're like, what, where did that come from? How, you know, um, because they've not been a part of all those conversations. And so what we need to do to lead change well, to respond to these kinds of challenges on the left, is to put as much time and energy into thinking about how to communicate as we put into what it is that we're changing and, and what, what we're initiating. So if these are the challenges on the left, and these are ways to respond to them, on the right to lead change well. We're gonna go back into uh, breakout groups one more time. Uh, and I want you to think about which of the challenges that we talked about most resonates for you. And then thinking about some of those possible responses that were on the right. How do you need to respond? How do you need to respond to some of those challenges? So uh, it is 10.46. Uh, I'm going to turn off sharing again. Uh, so let's do another 10 minutes in the breakout groups, uh, Don, just like we, so just like we did before, uh, warning to you, the breakout groups are randomly assigned. So you're not going to be in the same, or wait, or are they going back into the same groups, Don? They're the, they're the same groups. I've got it set, Mike. Ah. Oh, okay, good. So you'll be back with the same people you were with before. Uh, 10 minutes to talk about those two questions. When we come back, we'll do like we did before. Uh, I'd love for you, some of you to share reflections from your breakout group uh, and any questions that you have or comments that you have. So let's take 10 minutes and uh, go into those breakout groups. Oh, I was muted. Hi, Dawn. I heard it though from your soul, so it was okay. <laughs>
Okay, I think that we are back. Um, would love to have heard some of your conversations. So at least give me a glimpse into what you talked about or questions that you have. Before you do that, I want to, um, I noticed in the chat that I think it was Maria uh, had said, you know, these challenges existed pre-COVID and I agree 100% with that. Um, what I believe is that COVID makes those challenges even greater and the conversations that I've had heard and had with so many people saying, we want to do something different as we emerge from COVID just brings us to the surface even more. Um, but yes, yeah, so those challenges are, you know, things that, that are not COVID, those specific challenges are things that are not COVID specific. So tell me uh, what you talked about in your breakout group or a question that you have. Uh, Dawn, this is Betsy. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Betsy. Go ahead. Um, one of the things that someone in our group brought up, and I, I thought this was so interesting and so uh, encouraging, but instead of eliminating something, maybe looking at to adapt or add something that would make it better so that people would be more comfortable with the challenge or the change instead of just eliminating something altogether. And I, I really like that approach. Go on. Yeah. Benny. Benny, we can hear you. Go ahead. And Thank you. On to both One of the of big you. things we talked about in our group was, uh, you know, like kind of buying a house place. It's location, location, location. For us, it was communication, communication, communication. That whatever potential changes that we cannot over communicate that enough to the people that we're trying to reach and ask to make changes. I think that's a great point about communication. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad you all talked about that. Um, if you want to take that a step further, uh, make sure as you're communicating that you're really clear about the why behind any change. Um, if you want to look at a, a helpful video on that, um, it's not church related, but look up Simon Sinek's video on a TED Talk. Um, it's based on his book, Start With Why, and I don't remember the title of the TED Talk, but I think he only has two TED Talks and they're both good. And Simon Sinek is spelled S-I-N-E-K. Uh, but getting to the why in your communication is also important for changes. Um, and I appreciated the earlier uh, comment as well about, you know, some if, if you don't have to actually end or kill off a program or something and can instead adapt, uh, that's a much better way to do it. Sometimes we don't have any choice but to end something, but when, when we can adapt, uh, then that's far better. What's another question or comment from your from your group conversations? Hi, this is Reggie. I um, uh, one of the one of the things we talked about is uh, like well, my congregation is talking about going back to the way things were, and I was trying to I'm trying to get them mentally prepared that it's going to be a new normal. Things are not going to be as they were. It's going to be a new normal, and. Um, and the pandemic has really already pushed us into change. We've been already pushed into change. So that's why it's not gonna be the same. And, uh, and it's, it's really a perfect time to uh, add things that's gonna um, contribute to the community or uh, encourage and uh, strengthen the congregation, you know, or even take some things away that's gonna be, that's also gonna help us to move forward and mature us. That's good, thanks, Reggie. So Stacy and then Maria, I know has a comment. I wanted to echo in our group, um, we did discuss about the importance of effective communication and consistently sharing the vision, but we also talked about um, building trust and asking ourselves, um, 
is what I'm doing building trust or if you will, does it erode trust and why trust is important to help us move forward? Okay, um, in our group, we talked about how in the last 18 months or so, we've learned from our congregants what church means to them. And apparently it's not what it's supposed to be. For some, it's social. For it, it has meanings that have very little to do with discipleship or the gospel. Um, and, you know, it was, it's somewhat appalling. Judy in our group mentioned someone in her in one of her uh, Bible studies or small groups used a phrase providential pause. And we saw this. That's a beautiful phrase. It seems to me we've been given an opportunity to remake the church as it was intended to be by Jesus Christ. So I think <laughs> I think it's time to redefine church and rebuild and renew and uh, not throw everything out because there's always some good things there, but we certainly have to take a new look at what will work and what will meet the needs of the community around us. Thanks to both of you. Great comments about, about trust and about this opportunity and, and about the learnings. Um, you know, there's, I, I wanna underscore, there's some intentionality about even that kind of listening, Maria, that you were mentioning to the congregation, right? And then to be able to step back and say, so what is this telling me right now? And then what do I do with that? Um, so thank you for sharing that. Someone else? Let me ask you this, and th this was not one of the questions you talked about in the group, but you know, as you've been listening and thinking and talking this morning, or maybe even apart from our time together today, is there one change that you really feel like this is something we need to do differently? Either we need to start or we need to change in my congregation you know, kind of the, we're not going back to normal, not everything the way it was before, because this is one thing that needs to, uh, that I think that we need to change, uh, or like I said, initiate uh, as we emerge from, from the pandemic. What would that be? This is Betsy again. Uh, the one thing that I think I need to change about myself and, and maybe the congregation as well. I can't judge what they're thinking, but it just seemed for so long we were told you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And now I need to reset my mind and say, I can do this. I can do that because my mind was sort of in a negative stage and maybe churches are like that too. I don't know. Thanks, Betsy. Chris, Denny again. For me, it's trying to help people understand that we're never going to be at a pre-pandemic normal again. And that having bodies in the pew may not be the answer totally answered. It's got to change. We have to change our attitude that there are other ways to reach people in addition to seeing them face to face. Thanks, Manny. Someone else? I know a couple are popping up comments in the chat also, which is helpful. I, I am seeing, I'm hearing that people want interactive worship. They want hmm. to hear they, they want to recite, they want liturgy, they want to be interactive because for months they haven't had that response. And I, I feel that that's pretty, I think that's pretty prevalent. Ricky, go ahead. All right, so uh, just uh, reacting uh, briefly to a comment which just made about, um, you know, trying to educate and communicate uh, the different ways we can interact with folks. I think uh, much to your point, um, 
about the the over communicating the why you know why is it valuable that we're engaging folks not just when they come to us and join us in a time of gathered worship or bible study or youth group but the idea that you know it is a two-way street and we're going out and letting you know every member understand that because then they understand ministry as well it's not just this one hour we're together but truly the life that we live and i'd encourage us folks to really expand our understanding Good, thank you. Someone else, is there a change that, that you're thinking this is what we need to work on in our congregation? Hi, Lynn George. Hi, so I, I think, uh, and one of the things we're doing at Grove Church is we're trying to start to understand that we're probably not ever gonna have a new normal that's going to stay the same, that it's always gonna be changing. And if we can move into being okay with that as life happens in our community and or in the church, that we we probably can be a really vital a congregation and um, part of the community. That's what we really want to do is become part of the community in a new way. Yeah, um, this is. Pastor Vic, I want to kind of echo those second those, those sentiments uh, from Reverend Lynn and just in the fact that um, our congregation um, is now spending more time with um, how we engage with our community and how we can be engaging and using our worship services to, to be more open to the community, um, kind of being more flexible in how we, how and when we worship and also trying different things where we can reach the unchurched. Because uh, uh, a lot of our conversation sometimes is around people who come to church. Uh, we know that a lot of that is changing, essentially how we, how we engage uh, people in community, uh, speaking language, engaging in service, um, and really kind of uh, taking advantage of technology as well. Um, there's some opportunities that I think we can we can build on um, if we um, are willing and if we can trust one another to do it. I think um, we can actually be stronger than we were before. Anyone else? I'm not seeing any mic. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, so we're going to move into the last part of our of today's conversation, which is you remember the we we talked about what's going on. We talked about what does this mean for our congregation. But I told you at the start, I think it's also important for us to ask the question, what does this mean for me? Um, now, let me, I'll preface this by saying, this section um, is written really with pastors and vocational, uh, you know, church leaders. So, you know, other associate pastors, church staff members in mind. Um, if that's not you, if you're in a volunteer role, um, I think there's still application for you to think about what does this mean for me, but also I want to encourage you to think about what is life like what for your pastor right now? What has life been like for your pastor for the last year and a half as we talk about this? And what, what does that mean for how you might need to support your pastor differently in this season as we go forward? So um, looking again at some research. Now, this is a bit older research. This is from over a year ago from the Barton Research Group. Um, but there's been a significant toll on faith leaders. When they did this research, uh, 
uh, they asked in the last week and they named a number of different emotions. 51% said they had been tired. 41% said that they had felt exhausted. 41% said they felt sad. 39% said they had felt panicked. Um, and then they asked in the last four weeks, uh, have you felt overwhelmed? 68% said either frequently or sometimes. 52% of faith leaders said that they had been lonely frequently or sometimes. Now, those numbers may have, I'm sure, have changed some uh, because this is in the early days of the pandemic. And yet, from the conversations that I'm having, tired, exhausted uh, are still very much the norm. Overwhelmed is very much the norm. Um, maybe a little bit less with the sad or panicked because we settled in, maybe a little bit less with lonely because um, we've been able to gather more in person, even though in reality, there were many pastors and church staff members who felt lonely uh, pre-pandemic. Um, it's this really weird role where you're surrounded by people all the time, and yet you can't be fully yourself in many congregations around those very people that you're surrounded by. And so there really is a toll on faith leaders. Uh, and it's not surprising because when you think about all of what people have experienced during faith leaders have experienced over the course of the pandemic, routine decisions, what's that, right? I mean, they're, they're there's no such thing as a routine decision. Uh, even, you know, I can't tell you how many people that I talked to in the summer that were like, oh, we're so excited about the fall. We, we will be able to have something that looks more like normal programming in the fall. And then the Delta variant uh, kicks in and even things that felt like they were well-planned and that could be routine decisions don't feel so routine anymore. Um, and so we experience an enormous amount of decision fatigue as a result of that. Uh, this may be a little bit less true today, but uh, especially early in the pandemic, one of the things that pastors and, and you know, that pastors uh, found to be just a, a significant part of their calling was the ability to be with people who were grieving, people who were ill, people who had experienced the death of a loved one and to be that pastoral presence for them. And then you couldn't be with them. And even today, there's, ex, there's still, in many cases, extra precautions we have to take to be able to do what have often been life-giving and very meaningful uh, parts of the pastoral responsibility. Uh, are you still preaching to a camera? Are you still pre-recording a worship service or streaming and having to be very conscious of that audience? You know, in the early days, that may have been the only audience you had was just that lens of a camera. Uh, and so for people who found great fulfillment in the, the, the physical, the, the nonverbal reactions of people in a congregation when they offered something meaningful from the gospel, you know, that was taken away. We certainly continue to see many conflicts over what the protocol should be around regathering and mask wearing. Uh, you know, I talked to one pastor from a different denomination a couple of months ago, and his church had actually changed denominational affiliation three years ago. And he said, the, the level of conflict I have in my congregation right now is far worse than what I experienced when we were going through this decision about whether to change denominations or not. Wow, all over a simple mask, right? And yet that's what I hear time and time again is uh, these decisions over what does it look like to be the church and to do it in a safe way uh, have become enormous. And then there is financial anxiety, right? Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we were convinced that it was going to be this horrible, horrible uh, event financially. Now, for most churches, it's turned out to not be nearly as bad as those dire predictions. And yet, as the pandemic drags on, there's still financial anxiety. There's questions about who really will come back that we've talked about earlier. Uh, there's, you know, this difficulty in planning for the future. You know, how easy is it to plan for Advent right now? Normally, you'd be well into your Advent planning 
uh, in your church. And yet, what is that going to look like this year? Will people be here for it? Can we do what we wanted to do? Um, it's so hard to plan for the future. And oh, by the way, add on top of that, for many pastors, there's this, there's something going on in their personal life. They haven't been able to see uh, an aging parent regularly. Uh, they have school-aged children that were at home doing virtual learning. They have someone in their family who's immunocompromised. And so the pandemic creates an extra level of stress for them. They have a spouse who is, uh, who has been a significant part of their, uh, the, their earnings for their family, who's underemployed or unemployed right now because of the pandemic. And that's all apart from what's going on at church, and yet it's a significant part of the stress that, they, that they're experiencing. When I talk to ministry leaders, I hear versions of this from many of them. Uh, and so, I say this just because I think it's important to name our reality. And for those of you, like I said, who are in volunteer leadership roles, it's important for you to understand that reality for those who are leading your congregations. The other part of this is that on March 12th or March 13th, when it became apparent that we were going to need to, to do things very differently, most of us thought that we were lining up for a sprint. And I'm, I'm a runner, I'm, I'm a longtime track guy. And so I'd, I'd gravitate towards these sorts of analogies, right? A sprint, you go as hard as you can for a short amount of time and then the race is over. And so March 12th, March 13th, we said, how can we switch to digital? You know, can we be in person at all? And we thought this was gonna last for a couple of weeks. It's that pastor in Memphis that I talked about who said, Sure, we can, we can do this for a couple of weeks. But we'll, we'll be back in person for Easter. And we didn't realize at the time that someone had signed us up without us even knowing it for a marathon. And even the marathon analogy is inaccurate because even in a marathon, there's the finish line. We know what the finish line is. We know how long it's going to be. It's going to be a long race, but we'll get there eventually. And I guess we can say we will get there eventually on the, and get to the other side of this pandemic, but we really don't know exactly when that's going to be. And that's a really hard race to be in, one in which it feels sometimes like we're running alone and we don't know where the end will be. And so the question that I want us to think about for just a couple of minutes here, uh, it's a, even though I'm not United Methodist, it's a good Wesleyan question that I hope all of you can recognize is how is it with your soul? Ruth Haley Barton in her book, Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership, says there's a real tension between what the human soul needs in order to be truly well and what life and leadership encourages and even requires. I suspect that some of you have really felt that tension over these last months, that what it feels like your church is demanding of you as a leader is in contrast with what your soul really needs. And so I, I want to suggest four things that can be food for our souls. And again, I think this is true for anyone that's on this call. I think it's especially true for those who are uh, church, who are clergy and church staff. Um, the first is to name it, to not hide behind a pastoral veneer. Uh, I hope that every one of you has somebody that you can say, look, it, I'm really not in a good place right now, if that's the case. Or if those uh, flashes on the slide a couple of back really resonated with you, I hope there's a place where it's okay for you to say, you know, this is all of what I'm feeling and experiencing. Uh, because if we don't talk about it, if we can't name it, if we feel like we have to be on all the time, uh, then that will not be healthy for us. And, and the reality is, and, and the reason um, that I think it's important to talk about this is, you know, you may be able to push through for some period of time, and it's been a long period of time right now, uh, but at some point, there's a real cost to that 
that will damage your leadership and ultimately will not be good for your congregation as well. So the second thing that I think is important to feed our souls is to be willing to ask for help. It goes along right with the first one, right? If, if we won't name it, then we're not willing to ask for help. If we will name the struggles, the challenges, the stresses that, we'll feel, that we feel, then the logical next step is to be able to say, here's the kind of help that I need. Uh, there may be lay people in your congregation, if, again, if you're a pastor, if you're a pastor, who, if you said, look, I'm, I'm struggling right now. I'm, this, is, this season has gone on a lot longer than I expected it to. Uh, they would say, how can I help you? Part of what I hope you'd be willing to do and able to do is say, here's how you can help me. You know, I'm, I'm guessing that a number of you are the only clergy person in your congregation. Uh, and so you feel a certain amount of responsibility and pressure that you have to be there all the time for pastoral care and preaching on Sundays. But can you let other people help you with that? A third thing that I would say um, is food for your soul is to prioritize life-giving relationships. I hope that you all, whether it's a, a clergy friend or just a, a, a non-clergy friend, have those people in your life that whenever you're with them, you can be real about who you are and you always walk away a little bit better off because you've been with them. Those are, that's what I mean by life giving relationships. Uh, and in the middle of the season, especially if you identify with that quote from Ruth Haley Barton from the previous slide, where it feels like the demands of leadership are not good for your soul, one of the things that we will often sacrifice is time in those life-giving relationships. We need to prioritize those. And then the other thing that I think is just as important is I've, I've been concerned when I talk to ministry leaders who have said, in all the chaos, I've let my spiritual practices go down the tube. I've let them go out the window. Uh, I don't spend as much time reading scripture, praying, meditating, just communing with God as I did pre-pandemic. Uh, and I know it's easy for me to sit on a Zoom screen uh, on this camera and say, you can't let that happen. But I know from my own personal story, I know from too many other ministry leaders that I've walked alongside of, if the spiritual practice practices uh, are not part of your regular routine, you'll suffer from that. Uh, and so even if that means that you don't spend quite as much time on a sermon or you don't have quite as much time for, uh, for other leadership duties, the spiritual practices are vitally important for your soul and your soul is important for your ability to lead well. So we're not going to go into breakout groups, but I'm going to put up these two questions and I'm going to take it off screen. And I want to give you an opportunity just to reflect on how it is with your soul or what your soul needs in this season. Or for you to say, you know, particularly some of you who are in volunteer roles, to offer a reflection on what you might have done or might need to do to better support uh, your pastor or other people on the staff of your church. So let me take this off. What's running to your mind right now as we talk about food for your soul and food for the soul of those around you and your church? Mike, just a comment. I think you're right on. Um, I've talked with clergy who are literally on the verge of are they going to stay? Are they going to leave? And we're seeing that trend nationally. Um, some of our gifted pastors uh, who are just exhausted um, and trying to encourage them to, to pause into a lot of discernment of is this COVID? Is this truly your call to leave, right? And so what we're seeing wider nationally with job transfers, we're also seeing within um, our clergy uh, concerns. Yeah, thanks, Don. That's exactly right.
How is it with your soul? What, what are you sensing right now? I, my name is Ann Tinner. I'm a certified lay minister. Um, my pastor is leaving tomorrow to go on a vacation, which has been put off several times. So I'm filling in and doing Bible study for her this week to make it so she didn't have to worry about that. I'm doing um, the whole worship service on Sunday. Um, and we've been, there are times when, when I've filled in and taken different things uh, from her to make it easier for her to, to get through. Being aware that it's been a very difficult time for, you know, but especially for the pastor. John, Thanks, Anne. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the concern that I have for our, our pastor, I am a, a in the CLM program, is that, that, first of all, she's new. She has a family. She has a young family. That, uh, and she has a child that has some health issues. Uh, you know, the whole process of moving from Tennessee back to Pennsylvania. Uh, the pandemic, all this has got to be weighing on her. And, and I try to personally stay in close contact with her face to face because even in my own struggles with issues, family, health, changes, uh, she has been very helpful to me. And I want to be there for her for the same reason. Uh, Lynn George again. So I have felt deeply called to prayer. I've always been into prayer, but uh, over this time, uh, it has deepened and has. Um, so I try not to preach constantly about prayer, but I think in the past year and a half, all, almost all of my sermons have been about prayer and ha have engaged the conversation congregation in prayer challenges and prayer vigils and we are just launching an all church prayer uh, initiative uh, based on Susan Nielsen Kibbe's open road adventure uh, breakthrough adventure in prayer we're really excited about it and we don't want to do anything unless we're bringing it to, to God in prayer first and we're looking to that for leading One of the most meaningful um, regular practices for me has been the 12 o'clock noon Eastern Pennsylvania Conference prayer time. It's a half an hour open to everyone. And several of us are, are, on, the call, are on this program today. And I just give thanks for that. And that has spawned other groups. And I give thanks, very helpful. Any others? Well, I appreciate um, what you all have shared, uh, both from the perspective of laity supporting their pastors and pastors trying to think about how to lead congregations well and take care of your soul in the midst of this. I talked to a pastor a few weeks ago who, um, it's new in ministry, um, was appointed to a new church, uh, and the previous pastor at that church had uh, left early. I don't remember even what the circumstances were. And so rather than waiting until July 1, he had moved to that church, the, the new pastor had moved there uh, in May, and so had not gotten to, you know, take a vacation like he had planned uh, before the July, the normal July one appointment cycle. Uh, and so took four days off in August after, you know, so he'd spent what May, May, June, July, uh, and just took four days off in August and got some pushback from the congregation about what are you doing taking vacation? You're brand new here. 
rather than them saying, thank you so much for coming early and helping us out when we were in this, you know, in this place. Um, it's just, it, it's a reminder to me, and I guess a caution to you uh, all that, you know, we need to be, we need to show extra grace towards each other in this season, not, you know, not act like that one church did. Um, I have one last slide uh, that I'm going to put up that actually just ties back in with some of what you all said and on this theme of food for your soul. And then um, I want to just offer a final opportunity for any closing reflections. So we talked about four kinds of food for your soul. And then the last one really is rest. Uh, and so uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for people who are stepping in to give their pastors an opportunity to rest. I'm grateful for pastors who recognize the importance of rest and say, I'm going to do it whether I really feel like I have the time for it or not. Todd Bolsinger, the author of Canoeing the Mountains, has a newer book out called Tempered Resilience. And he says, I have found that the heavier the demands of leading, the more regularly I should take both brief moments or longer stretches to leave behind the leading, to rest and reflect and remind myself that I am loved. Um, I don't think I can really add anything to that other than just to emphasize and underscore the importance, even in a demanding season, even when it seems like uh, our leadership is crucial, which it is, uh, and never ending the importance of still finding ways to rest. So out of all that we've talked about today, um, my last question for you all is, what are you taking away? What, what's one idea, one action, one nugget that, uh, you're taking back with you that will help you to lead more effectively that you'll be taking back and sharing with others in your church. What, what's your, what's one takeaway from today? I would say, this is Tawanda. I would say one takeaway for me as a new pastor is really sitting down with my congregation and talking about the why and the what it is, what our vision is, what do we uh, want to focus on? Those things to continue to fuel the energy um, in the midst of today's circumstances. So I'm really excited to have those nuggets to move forth and do that from today. Thanks, Tawanda. Hi, I'm Tracy Duncan. Um, early on in the conversation, you mentioned the word values. And I underscored that three times because I'm actually just catching up with the book, Quietly Courageous. And so he, uh, Gil Rendell talks about that a little bit in there. So when I heard that word, I'm like, that's my word, that's my word. So I was really excited to underline, uh, underline that and write it down. And um, earlier this year, I was uh, had some meetings before the summer with the congregation, just talking about what it was that they valued. So um, that's, that's gonna be a significant thing for me to take away from today. And also the word rest, and I'll just leave that right where it stands. Thank you, Tracy. Go ahead, Ricky. All right. Uh, so it was one of the discussion questions early in the presentation, but uh, when you were talking about um, those who have experienced difficulties amid the pandemic and what are we as the church specifically as pastors and other leaders doing to engage those who have found an increase in their faith an increase in prayer time and i really just like that and want to sit with that some more and talk about that with my church leaders to really get a sense of figuring out now what are we doing and how are we not just having a pity party for ourselves because of the circumstances we've gone through as a church but really to say, now, what are we doing to, to take this offering that God has laid at our feet and really to work with those who have found an increase in faith. So I'm looking forward to doing a lot of, a lot of sitting with that question. 
Thank you. Good. I'm thinking about like how you talked about sticky community and it goes to something Maria said. Um, she was saying some people just come because it's social. And I immediately was thinking about how Jesus was all about social and right. So it wasn't just social, but Jesus really did make time for that sticky community, all those social moments. Um, and so, you know, what are the ways that we can really create authentic and real community one with another um, not just on sunday mornings but um all week long and maria has her hand raised so i'll turn it to her throughout most of this presentation um in my role as lay leader and chair of the leadership team all i could think about was a need for leadership development and reassessing the leadership and i've been going through going through the congregation's faces in my head who can I approach to sit down and put together a coalition where we can discuss some of the things that were brought up this morning and begin to take some steps? Up to this point, I think most of our congregations have been reactive rather than proactive. And I think there's light at the end of the tunnel with this pandemic ending some point in time. And I think there's things that we can do before we get to the end of the tunnel to get us ready to jump out and land in a good place to be what we need to be. So um, I've been jotting little notes in the margins of my note pages here, who are names of people I'm gonna call and approach <laughs> and start uh, presenting some of the stuff to them. Thank you for this presentation, it's been very helpful. Good, thanks Maria. Um, I've been thinking about the um, how do we build trust. Um, I've started in my uh, current congregation. I started on April 1st, 2020, which was, um, and the, and my, my two weeks uh, and my resignation from my previous church was the uh, day before the shutdown. And again, none of that was planned. So not only did uh, we not have any closure with the previous appointment, but I had to then meet everybody online um, at my new appointment. And so I think there just hasn't been the opportunity to build trust. Um, and then that way, and you know, if I come up with some new great idea, and I think people are just kind of like, Okay, you know, because it, it, there just hasn't been an opportunity to trust and the lead pastor that I served with was only appointed the July before the pandemic. So neither one of us have really have enough, I guess, buy in with the congregation to kind of lead them into next steps. Uh, so I think we kind of need to go back to the basics of building trust. And trust is a really funny thing um, in ministry leadership, from my, my opinion, uh, because we tend to think, look, I'm, I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian leader, of course they should trust me, right? I mean, you know, I don't lie, I try to do my best to, you know, follow all the Ten Commandments and do the things that Jesus taught, of course they should trust, but that's not what we're really talking about when we talk about trust. I mean, yeah, yes, that, yes, we're talking about all of that. But that's just foundational level. Uh, that kind of trust is not what ultimately gets someone to say, yes, I actually buy into and, and will be a part of starting something new, of change. So, so I think that's a great point. Thanks, Tiffany. Anyone else? Well, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have been with you all this morning. Um, thanks for your feedback, for your conversations, both in the larger group and in the small group. Um, my prayer is that, uh, that for every one of you, that there will be one or two things out of this conversation that will uh, really help you and your congregations to, uh, as we continue to move through and beyond the pandemic, to be all that God wants you to be. So I'm, I'm grateful. Don, let me turn it back over to you for any final closing comments. 
We just want to give thanks to God for you, Mike, for your work um, with the Texas Methodist Foundation for the resource that they are uh, to the wider church as well. Um, it's it's been a joy to have you, and for all those who those who participated, thank you uh, for being present not just this day, but as we continue to disciple together. So God bless you. Have a good rest of your day. Take care, friends. Bye.